You'll have probably heard of some of the most notorious cults in history before. Cults like the Heaven's Gate, where in March 1997, all 39 members committed in preparation for their transition to heaven. The Order of the Solar Temple, where nearly 100 members committed or were killed. Or the most infamous cult in history, the People's Temple, led by Reverend Jim Jones, which led to the death of 900 people, killed by drinking a poison drink. In fact, there's been thousands of cults in history. The Children of God, the Buddhafield, the Branch Davidans, Um Sharinko, Rajneshpuram, the list goes on and on. But here in Britain, those cults seem far away. And you might look at them and think, well, that could never happen here. But you'd be wrong. Britain is home to an estimated 2,000 cults operating right now, possibly on your very street. And so in this video, we'll take a look at some of the most notorious cults in British history and a look at the cults which are operating right now. It's an incredible story that's hard to believe, but it is absolutely true. We'll take a look at cults with satanic rituals, mind-boggling beliefs, cults where the physical and abuse of members is prolific, and cults with the most bizarre enigmatic leaders. I'm Joshua Perry Parker, and this is British Cults Unveiled. Our first cult takes us to Brixton in South London. The Workers' Institute. The Workers' Institute of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought may sound like a mundane political group, but it was in fact one of the most brutal and sadistic cults in British history. The cult was formed in 1974 and led by Aravidan Balakrishnan, known to his followers as Comrade Bala. Comrade Bala attracted members to his cult by giving political lectures and conducting sit-ins. His followers believed that their true purpose was to start a revolution and overthrow the British state. Their headquarters in Acre Lane, Brixton, known as the Mao Zedong Memorial Centre, first opened its doors in October 1976. Comrade Bala quickly cultivated a small but dedicated following, of between 10 to 20 women, and they lived together in communes or nearby in co-housing. In the 1970s, when this cult first formed, most people laughed at it, and the only news clippings you'll see from around that time are those ridiculing the cult and its grand political beliefs that they would start a revolution and bring down the British state. But it was here where Comrade Bala started to cement his role as a controlling and powerful cult leader. He began to dictate to his followers the jobs they were required to do. Members of the cult were handed a rotor of chores, which was strictly enforced. Some members were allowed to work, undertaking jobs such as cleaners, and were made to give all of their earnings to Comrade Bala. He told them it was for the greater good of the cult. If anybody objected or complained, he would publicly ridicule them in front of other members, stating that their transgressions were against the goals and aims of the cult. Over the months, he continued to introduce draconian rules on his followers. He started by allowing them only to go out in pairs, which he told them was because the area they lived in was notorious for violence and, he said, anything could happen to them. The women in the cult became more and more isolated as they slowly lost their freedom and became separated from the outside world. Slowly, surely, over time, Comrade Bala started to dominate every aspect of their lives. By 1978, the police were beginning to have concerns about what exactly was going on behind the secretive walls in Brixton. And so, in March 1978, the police conducted its first raid on the cult, supposedly on the pretense of suspected drug offences. 
The raid quickly became violent, and Comrade Bala ordered his followers to fight back and attack the police. In the end, he and nine of his followers were arrested and sent to jail for short sentences. When Comrade Bala was released in the 1980s, he decided to take his cult underground, completely out of sight of society and the police. And it was at this point where the cult became more sadistic and surreal. Comrade Bala began to construct a mythical universe for his followers and worked to ensure a cult of personality developed around him. He convinced his followers that he was God. He convinced them that everything was controlled by him. He told his followers that he alone could overthrow governments, control natural disasters and make people live or die. He even created a mythical machine called Jackie, an acronym for Jehovah, Allah, Christ, Krishna and immortal Eswaran. He told his followers he could use this machine to monitor all thoughts and control people's minds. He told his followers that his machine allowed him to see inside their minds so he could see if they were having any transgressions, any sinful thoughts or doubts about him or the cult. By now, those women who had joined his cult were unable to escape. They were not permitted to leave the commune and had been brainwashed into worshipping Comrade Bala. Believing that he alone was an all-powerful god, while they were not physically chained down, the door to the commune was always unlocked, they were held by invisible handcuffs, terrified of leaving, after being subjected to a decade of brainwashing and the cult of personality created around the leader. Comrade Bala started a campaign of violence, abuse and rape on his followers. He would physically beat his followers when they did something wrong and force the other cult members to watch. He began to assault his followers. One of his particularly sadistic actions was to force his followers to swallow his amulet, as he told them it was the elixir of light. He kept his members as slaves, forcing them to do domestic chores and beating and raping them when they tried to rebel. One of his followers, who had been in the cult for over a decade, tried to escape one evening. Comrade Bala caught her, and she was bound and left gagged on the living room floor, for all the other members to see. He would even make his followers beat each other. And so these bruised and broken women, believing they were being commanded by God himself, were made to hit and attack each other while he watched. He would continually buy stacks of books, all on grand things like philosophy, science, medicine, and stack them up high around the compound. He used this to convince his followers just how smart he was compared to them. This all took place out of sight of society. Nobody knew what was really going on at this normal-looking South London address. During this time, Comrade Bala also fathered a child with one of his followers. She grew up entirely in the commune. She never left and was never allowed outside. She did not go to school and was brought up entirely within the cult and by its members. During the late 1980s and the 1990s, the sadistic cult continued and two of his followers tragically lost their lives. One member, Katie Morgan Davis, tried to escape out of a top floor window and fell. She was taken to hospital, but later died from her injuries. Another one of his followers, Okar Eng, hit her head on a cupboard and suffered a stroke in 2001. She was forbidden to leave the commune to get any medical treatment, and so she died the next day. The cult continued all the way up until 2003, operating on a normal street in South London, looking completely ordinary, while inside a psychopathic cult leader imprisoned, beat and abused his members. The child who was born into the cult, Comrade Bala's daughter, would stand at the upstairs window for hours, 
with a sign that she'd written that said, help me. But the writing was too small for anyone outside to see, or people were just too busy to notice. It was in 2003 when one of the cult members saw a documentary television show on ITV about forced marriage in the UK that she saw her opportunity to escape. She saw how other women had been forced into relationships, unable to escape, and hearing their stories about how they had finally broken free gave her the strength to break out. She memorised the telephone number that was shown at the end of the screen for any victim seeking support. And after 30 years of being kept a prisoner in the cult, she managed to sneak to a phone and call the number for help. She was put through to the Freedom Charity and told them in a whisper that she thought something wasn't right. She'd been held captive for 30 years by God and she wanted to be free. The Freedom Charity immediately contacted the police. The police swooped on the compound and arrested Comrade Bala and his wife. The women, some held captive for over 30 years, were freed. They were described as highly traumatised by the police and transferred to a secure location to receive medical care. Some members had limited mobility, having been kept prisoner for so long in the commune. Others had barely seen the outside world and stood terrified of the cars and the noise around them. Comrade Bala was put on trial in 2015, where he made bizarre statements to the court. For example, telling them that his special mind-reading machine Jackie was responsible for the death of the Malaysian Prime Minister and that when one of his cult members tried to challenge his membership, it had resulted in the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. On the 4th of December 2015, over 40 years after he started his cult, Comrade Bala was convicted of child cruelty, false imprisonment, four counts of six counts of indecent assault and two counts of assault. He was jailed for 23 years. On the 8th of April 2022, Comrade Bala died in prison. The Workers' Institute cult was a truly shocking example of a modern cult in Britain. Behind an ordinary address in South London, right the way up until 2003, a psychopathic cult leader sadistically beat and tortured his followers, convincing them that he was God and controlling their every move. The Process Church of the Final Judgment. And for our next cult, we're going back to London in the swinging 60s. And this one is quite a trip. The Process Church, as it was commonly known, was founded in London in 1963 by Mary Ann McLean and Robert Moore. They were a couple with an unconventional wisdom. Former Scientologists, they embarked on a journey to redefine religion and their beliefs were a heady mix of Scientology, sex, Christianity and Satanism, all thrown together in a heady brew. We should also state that the couple were known for taking magic mushrooms, which perhaps shaped some of their ideas. The church believed in four gods, Jehovah, Christ, Lucifer and Satan, and they believed that you had to balance all four gods to find unity. They stated to their followers that there would be a day of violent final judgment where all four gods would come together and cause an apocalypse, a cosmic reckoning where humanity would face its ultimate destiny. Their members all lived in communes in Mayfair and hundreds of them dressed in black cloaks resembling the satanic goat of Mendes and sporting the logo of the group, a swastika-like mandala. They would walk cloaked around the streets of London and try to recruit new members. Even for the 1960s, it was quite a sight. The cult was controversial for its radical beliefs and strange rituals and attracted much scrutiny and ridicule at the time. The processions, as they were known, produced radio and TV shows, as well as newsletters, books and magazines, all espousing an increasingly apocalyptic philosophy. Members sold these magazines in the street 
and would preach to potential converts and donors. The editions of the magazine were called things like Sex, Death and Fear, and included interviews with supporters of the time, like Mick Jagger. The group was strict and authoritarian, and in his book Love, Sex, Fear, Death, The Inside Story of the Process Church, author Timothy Wiley, a former member, described the sect as rigid and authoritarian, and chronicled accounts of and psychological abuse in the Process Church. The communal life of the cult was strictly regulated. Among group members, sex and the use of drugs and alcohol were strictly rationed, with these practices being regarded as a distraction from spiritual work. However, it did not appear that they were rationed for their leaders. The cult quickly spread from the UK to Canada and the US, and it further gained notoriety when it was said that the serial killer, Charles Manson, was a member of the cult. Something that is still debated to this day. When Charles Manson was asked at his trial whether he had a connection with the cult's leader Robert Moore, he said, you're looking at him. Moore and I are one and the same. The Process Church denied that they had an involvement with Manson. But the prison records show that two members of the Process Church visited Manson in prison. The church also included an article in its 1971 Death issue magazine, which included a short essay written by Charles Manson himself. The cult was accused of Satanism, accused of sacrificing Alsatian dogs, which they collected and often followed them around in public. And they were accused by some of conducting death rituals. And considering they published articles by Charles Manson in their magazine called Death, this is hardly surprising. After all this controversy, public donations to the church dwindled and the cult's members gradually left. In 1993, the church adopted another new identity, becoming Best Friends, a non-profit group devoted to animal rescue and care. The truth is that even after 60 years, this cult still remains an enigma. Every book that is written about it seems to add more questions than answers. The cult has become the stuff of urban legend, symbolic of the satanic panic of the 1980s. It is remembered around the world for hundreds of figures walking around in black robes and has attracted interest ever since. Maybe it was just a new age church exploring different religious ideas. Maybe they were a satanic cult conducting blood rituals behind closed doors. Or maybe the leaders were all just high. Either way, the enduring mystery of this cult nestled quietly in Mayfair, central London, remains to this day. The London Church of Christ. It was in 1982 where behind a veneer of religion and a cloak of acceptability, a dangerous cult was developing in London. The London Church of Christ, originally founded in Boston by the USA breakaway preacher Kip McKean, made the move to the UK in the 1980s, and quickly recruited over 1,300 members. The cult preached an extreme form of Christianity, establishing the belief that the church and its disciples alone were the only ones destined for heaven. They told their followers that there were 12 million lost souls in London destined to go to hell. The cult quickly set up and operated a strict hierarchy to control their members. Every member of the cult, or as they were known, disciples, upon joining was allocated a senior discipler. This senior discipler would also have somebody above them, and at the top were the leaders of the church, who claimed to be appointed by God. This pyramid hierarchy, where everyone had to follow a discipler, was how the cult established order. As soon as you joined the cult, your discipler would start to exercise control over you. They would start subtly by evangelising, preaching God's word to you, telling you that they know the truth from the higher power, and then gradually begin to take control of your life. They would start by advising you, telling you who you should see, what you should say to your family, what you should spend your money on. 
And this is how they took control. They told the disciples they were only passing on God's word to them. The disciples were told by the leaders to hammer their flock, to break them, until they did whatever they were told. The cult members were persuaded to reveal intimate details of their lives. Records of sins, their incomes, relationships, habits were all collected and passed to the church leaders and they would be used against anyone who stepped out of line. The disciples became quickly dehumanised. They were ridiculed and demeaned if they did not conform. Many developed a desperate anxiety to fit in, to do everything they could to please their discipler. Many started to dress like their discipler, who themselves dressed like their leaders. They copied their clothes, their haircuts, their mannerisms. Those who were single or did not have families were pressured into moving into overcrowded communes. They were easier to control that way. The disciples were only permitted to go out of the commune in groups, which further worked to isolate them from the rest of society. Disciples even exerted strong control over their disciples' intimate life. Followers were only permitted to date if their discipler approved of it. And even then, only with another cult member. Dating couples were strictly restricted to 35 minutes a week on the phone and their discipler would listen in the background. When the cult authorised a marriage, the disciples decided the length of the honeymoon and couples were expected to seek permission to have children. All disciples were expected to recruit new members to the cult. Members were all trained in the techniques of tubing, approaching people on the underground and blitzing where they would recruit in shopping centres and high streets. They were told to be aggressive when recruiting. The manual describes their recruiting campaign as Operation Devastation, while the welcome for potential members was termed love bombing. Students were prime targets and many universities in London quickly banned the church from entering their campuses. Disciples who did not recruit enough new members were ridiculed in weekly sermons. Every member was expected to give at least 10% of their earnings to the cult, as well as contributing to collections every Sunday. They were also expected to give special contributions at least twice a year, and that would need to be 10 times their normal weekly contributions. Many cult members could not keep up with this demand, and went into debt. The disciples didn't care. As their members became wrapped up in debt, the disciples would tell them to trust them and trust in God's plan. Families saw their children, who had been lured into the cult, become blank, in mountains of debt, unresponsive and unable to communicate. Those who managed to break away and escape the cult spoke out about their experiences. They told the press how they were recruited and then how the disciples took control of every aspect of their lives. Their stories appeared in the media, warning others of the dangers of the cult. But inside the cult, there were still hundreds of members. So, what happened to the London Church of Christ? Well, believe it or not, it's still operating. Both in the US and the UK, the cult continues to run. And in fact, in 2023, the cult took an even more sinister turn when former members in the US mounted a legal case against the church, stating that sexual abuse and child sexual abuse was taking place and was covered up by the cult's leaders. The case says that the cult's children's division, called Kids Kingdom, served as a demented playground for abusers. The abuse is alleged to have taken place from the 1970s right up until 2012. And so, today, the London Church of Christ continues running. On its website, they seem to acknowledge the past issues they have had, stating, In 2003, our worldwide family of churches went through a very challenging period, where we had to take time to assess ourselves and our direction. We spent some years reflecting, discussing and resolving. 
This, although hard for us, actually led to an opportunity for greater growth and depth. The London church continues to grow both in maturity and in number since then. Though it was a difficult time for all of us, the transformation has been profound. You can be the judge. But be aware, next time you're in London on the Tube, if someone comes up to you asking you to join an exciting international church, be careful what you say. The Jesus Army The Jesus Army, also known as the Jesus Fellowship, was perhaps the biggest known cult operating in Britain. At its peak, it had over 3,500 members in over 23 congregations. You'll probably recognise the cult from its colourful buses, which its members used to travel around the UK to try and recruit new cult members. But, behind the rainbows, this cult was hiding many dark secrets, some of which are only coming to light now. The Jesus Army was founded in 1969 by Noel Stanton in Northampton. Stanton envisioned a community that would embody the teachings of Jesus Christ, emphasising communal living, evangelism and social outreach. The Jesus Army's members lived together in communes, groups of communal houses linked together, sharing everything from homes to their possessions. Dressed in distinctive red tunics, they took to the streets for evangelism, spreading their messages with passion and zeal. The Jesus Army grew rapidly, quickly expanding its reach across the UK. In addition to street evangelism, the community was involved in various social outreach programmes, providing support for the homeless, those struggling with addiction and marginalised communities. On the outside, the cult seemed like a happy utopia, championing and driving good Christian values across the UK. But the reality inside the group was much darker. Its leader, Noel Stanton, was a firebrand preacher. He preached daily about the sins of the flesh and cursed wayward members as backsliders who were going to hell. The leadership was strict and authoritarian. Women who joined the cult were expected to show deference to the men. There was no TV or radio allowed and very little fun. Instead, members were expected to use their time doing chores in the commune or being out on the street recruiting new members. The men would run shops and work on farms and were expected to give all of their salary to the church. Women would look after the men and were encouraged to claim benefits and donate them to the cult. Women and children were not allowed out unless they were supervised by a man. The cult's members' access to the outside world was severely limited. Newspapers would be delivered to the cult, but with large sections which had been cut out by the leaders. The cult also held weekly sessions where members were forced, often in tears, to confess their faults and sins to each other. There were daily exorcism sessions, where members were expected to recant their sins while they were yelled at about demonic manifestations. It was an intense regime of work and worship, where the leaders were seen as gods. Children in the cult had no fun, no toys, and they were even sometimes scolded for reading. At the age of 12 or 13, children were often separated from their parents and instead allocated a male shepherd who would oversee their spiritual development. If this strikes you as odd, you'd be completely right. And horrifically, it came to light in 2019 that children in the Jesus Army had been subjected to emotional, physical and abuse on a prolific scale. Children were stripped and beaten in front of members for misbehaving. As children had been separated from their parents, any man was allowed to discipline the children and groups of men would conduct brutal and sexualised beatings of young children. There are countless accounts from former members who were subjected to sexual abuse when they were children. It was prolific across the cult, with some children being abused by multiple senior members. 
In some families, all siblings were subjected to rape and abuse throughout their time in the cult. In total, 43 church leaders have been linked to the abuse scandal, including the leader Noel Scranton. A BBC investigation revealed hundreds of former members were seeking damages for physical and psychological abuse. And by 2020, 10 of the cult leaders had been convicted of sex offences. However, this is likely just the tip of the iceberg. At the time of recording this video, over 800 former members have come forward alleging psychological, physical or sexual abuse. Victims who came forward said that the leadership covered up the abuse and allowed it to happen. In 2019, amidst mounting controversies and allegations, the Jesus Army disbanded. Its assets, around £50 million, all amassed from its members' earnings, were transferred to a charitable trust and the Jesus Fellowship Redress Scheme was launched. This scheme allows victims of the cult to claim compensation and a written apology from the Jesus Army for the abuse they experienced. However, no financial compensation can ever make up for the systemic abuse of so many experienced in the cult and the so many lives that have been irreversibly damaged in the UK's most dangerous cult.